So thank you for your presence, sir. And um, it is indeed a great pleasure to introduce you, Professor Stefano Signoretti, that uh, is one of the leading national and, uh, let's say, international experts uh, on the traumatic brain injury and uh, on the brain concussion. And uh, this uh, uh, is uh, very important for us also because this experience uh, is uh, carried out also in the U uh, United States for a long time, several years, I mean, under the guidance uh, of Professor Anthony Marmaru and uh, in Richmond. Uh, it is one of the most important center for the neurotraumatology and uh, neurosurgery, uh, okay? And, uh, this experience uh, was then translated also in a remarkable scientific activity by a clinical and biochemical also relevance, uh, this time under the guidance of uh, Professor Vagnozzi and Professor Lazzarino that are here present, uh, thanks. And so I want just uh, to uh, um, spend two words about the title because it's very important uh, to consider the importance of the traumatic brain injury as a real pandemic. Uh, and of course, uh, the meaning, uh, it will be explained better by Professor Signoretti, but uh, consider first that more than 10 millions uh, of persons uh, every year uh, and worldwide are affected by this particular pathology. So please, thanks, it's up to you. Maybe now. Good afternoon. It is a true honor and a privilege, along with a little bit of emotion, because I'm in front of my mentors. They've been with me 28 years. Partiamo con il video. When we discussed this, the big challenge was to keep the attention high. So PowerPoint slide failed. So we changed our format and we adopted more of a storyboard, which is very modern today. And uh, what we will do, we will try to make a journey. But this time, the map is very uncertain. As you can see, the brain becomes a nebulous because that's the condition that we still, after so many years, live today. The journey will be divided in two paths. The first, a big freeway when we run fast and then we make accidents. Or we explore the clinical burden of a traumatic brain injury, which is a terrible occurrence. We will define it and try to understand the epidemiology and then we will, go back to the, we will come back to the pandemic concept, which I used just because of this particular situation. We will investigate about the main pathophysiology and intracranial consequent pathology up to something that we do not know and we do not see, which is the terrible diffuse axonal injury, just to link to the metabolic way in which we will understand and explore the network, the complex energetic system that keeps a cell alive, and all the stresses that start immediately after trauma, and all the deregulation, and all the final molecular biology response. Because traumatic brain injury is a macroscopic event, but it reaches very, very deep words up to the gene regulation, okay? By this combination, we will give you the state of the art, which is not else, nothing else than the actual level of knowledge, the front line of research, and uh, give it to you as it is. We know filters. We know muscle or proof, just what we don't know. But what do we know is that traumatic brain injury is a leading, basically the sixth cause, all ages, the first under 42, under 45 years of age. Now, a little bit of a, 
uh, game world. What is a pandemic? Pandemic is an epidemic. Well, thank you. It's an epidemic that crosses the boundaries and becomes spread worldwide. Today, everybody knows what a pandemic is and what an epidemic is. Um, but the main feature of this, it is a disease have to affect people at the same time. It's not like cancer, for example, which is a very, very diffuse, but it doesn't affect people at the same exact time. And uh, how a pandemic will end? Well, pandemic always ends, some way or another. It, we either su succeed in the eradication of the disease, or we make a sort of a dealing. So it becomes endemic. What does it mean? It means that we have a certain number of cases per year, very stable, very, very spread. So it's TBI endemic. Well, one, one thing I've learned is that if the question is wrong, the answer cannot be right. It's neither. It's just something that we cannot truly classify. But against taxonomists and epidemiologists would say it's not, because it must to affect simultaneously and he has to reach multiple persons. Otherwise, it cannot be considered neither pandemics nor endemics. Are we so sure about this? Maybe not. Maybe trauma is something that can affect multiple people. What is the actual situation? There is an indicator which is called the global burden of disease. And this is the last study, because it takes a lot of data to come out with this. And we measure the burden of a disease by calculating the year of health lost, the year that you live from that moment on because you have been affected by the disease. And the burden is enormous. 12 million people per year will experience a TBI serious enough to require some medical intervention. 60% traffic, 20% falls, 10% aggression, 10% we go miscellaneous. Maybe you've been a, beaten after an accident. Okay. Talking about this is disturbing because TBI is not a disease. It's just a transfer of energy from a system to another system that probably didn't need it, okay? We have our own energy system. So we deeply alterate what? Homeostasis. We, the trauma is the most provocative insult for every homeostasis. If you look at these two words, we will see with the dark green here that the numbers of, acts of um, TBI is higher here. But you can see here the trauma related to traffic accident. And that gives, in terms of absolute number, one value. But in terms of percentage and of burden, another value. Now, the WHO has divided the globe in seven regions, OK? So we have uh, American and Canadian. We have the uh, so-called um, Latin America. We have the Eastern Mediterranean region, which is I Iraq, Iran, and, and all the Middle East. The Middle. Uh, less middle, uh, the Africa, the Europe, the West Pacific region, and the Southeast region. Well, the burden of the disease is here. Th these are the people, this is the population that pays the highest cost of TBI in terms of what? In terms of disability. These people do not have the same attention that they have here. The golden hour for us in Tanzania is four to six hours before they receive attention. So there is a huge disproportion in terms of taking care, and it appears that in North America and Europe, the causes of trauma are different, and they are probably less severe. The main cause of trauma in the so-called low and middle income countries is still road traffic accident, but they don't have helmets rules. They don't have secure vehicles. So they are condemned to something that carry the biggest burden, because this is a lot of people, much more people, even if in absolute terms 
there are more trauma in other. Uh, so 80% of the world's people with disability lives in countries where they cannot do nothing about it because only 2% can receive a rehabilitation service. And that is something we need to take into consideration. For example, where we go for vacation, just to think about it. Okay. Uh, this is a condition that is not, uh, does, 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 does not give any sign of ameliorating. And so the synthesis is dramatic. Each year, 69 millions of people will be affected by TBI. Thank God there will be 80% of um, my TBI and only few in, in percentage. And still, this is a tremendous incidence. This, this, this incidence here is three times every other disease, but nobody speaks about this. It looks like against TBI, there is a sort of resignation. It looks like once it happened, it must, it must be left where it is. And uh, let's try to understand what happens. Nothing happens. It, it happens that we are hit, that we are tilted some way, or we are penetrated, and our brain function stops. So this is trauma, very, very intuitive. This is what happens at 50 kilometers per hour, constant acceleration, constant velocity, no acceleration, 50, okay? And uh, as you can see, we will talk about this. This is in a, in a uh, frontoposterior fashion. As you can see, is it is a very heterogeneous insult. It's very difficult to standardize this insult, and it's made of various moments, coup and contra-coup. Now, if we go deeper, and see what happens uh, a little bit more, more zoomed, we will see that there is also rotation. There are many, many physical uh, things that intervene in generating the final result. And uh, also, this os oscillation, that's very, is, uh, they're very dangerous for future evolution. Now, what is this? Now, today, we are very used to scales and algorithms. Everything is scaled. Today, you can, everything can be uh, numbered. But in 1974, there was a true revolution. These gentlemen here, they invented the Glasgow, the Glasgow comma scale. And uh, according to this, but remember, this is a assessment of impaired consciousness. This is just if you are awake or not doesn't tell you any, anymore. We divide trauma in mild, moderate, and severe. How do we reach this? Well, we analyze the patient, and we see, for example, if he's awake, if he's able to speak, and if he's obey commands, simple commands, like show me three fingers, for example. If this is OK, it's 15. Minimum is three. Three is irreversible coma. Now, are we sure that this is enough? This is a very powerful instrument. But before coming to a definitive score, we need at least three times. Because you assess GCS at the time, at the scene, is one thing. After transportation, you get to DR, that's another thing. And after resuscitation, that's another. Which one is the prognostic one? Maybe the best? I don't know. This is still under discussion. And what happens? if? patient is drunk. He will not obey your commands, but he's awake. And what happens if the patient um, suffer uh, facial trauma and he cannot speak, or if it's been intubated because of a lung damage? So the most important thing in the GCS is the model response, because only one is voluntary. These are considered involuntary response. So by Categorizing the level of consciousness, we have assumed for 30 years that that will correspond to the severity of injury. It's a little bit hazardous assumption. Why are we so interested in this? But because stats tell us that half of the severely injured patient, that means they have GCS below eight, carry hematomas, which is 
a very rare condition in mild injury. Now, this is very heterogeneous. This, a patient 13, is a patient about to be discharged. A patient 9 is a patient who risks to be intubated. But now, we need to understand truly what happens at the time of impact. Now, we can have two types of trauma, and speed is fundamental variable. If we have a so-called slow or very dynamic, and this will generate contact forces and uh, inertial forces. That depends if there is impact or not impact. But anyway, is the combination of this, coupe and contra coupe, acceleration linear and angular acceleration, that will almost mathematically generate. So this is hard science. This is physics. Humans are not very prompt to deal with physics. And so all the intracranial lesions that we will go on and explore are the consequence, the mathematical consequence has been, has been proved into the laboratory. And this is the result of this interaction. The only exception we will talk about this is diffuse axonal injury that requires one type of acceleration. What's epidural hematoma? Well, let's say it's a scary occurrence. You go to DR, you're 15. After three, four hours, you become comatose. See how slippery is the GCS. And because you have a gradient of pressure and you have the presence of this hematoma here between the dura and the inner space and the inner um, bone surface. But here, TBI is due mainly to contact forces. There's no much um, linear and angular acceleration intervening. So, this is a rage against the clock, but once you operate it, usually this is zero mortality. Maybe some, because of some other reason, can a little bit of rescue at the beginning, but usually this is a good prognosis. But just below the dura, a few millimeters, that's another word. Why? First of all, the subdural space is a virtual space, but it's a space that exists if you put something in, like the inflatables. Okay? So we have a huge hematoma here, but the problem is not the hematoma because we can remove this hematoma like we did in the other one. The problem is what caused this hematoma, which are important linear acceleration and translation forces. So here, there is something underlying because this patient will not wake up like the epidural. And the difference is not in and out of the meanings. The difference is the biomechanical born. Now, this is another cursed chapter. And now we call them traumatic parenchymal lesion. They're like bruise. They're like, you know, small ecchymosis on the cortex. They are very frequent. They're always present, even sometimes in mild TBI. Uh, they persist one out of fifth, even if you operate. And they are divided into contusion or, or truly uh, intracellular by hematoma, sometimes delayed. But then there is other lesions that we do not see, which are non-focal, like edema, engorgement, and swelling. We will take care of this, but we still have a lot of problems in taking care of this especially edema, because as we will see, vascular engorgement can be uh, dealt enough with uh, partial victory. But edema, we are still, we're still very far away to resolve. So here's a dramatic composition of post-traumatic brain lesion, epidural, subdural, intraparenchymal hemorrhage. That's brain swelling. This is the ball brain. This is intraventricular hemorrhage and with a cranial um, crash. And this is the very rare, only four in you know, all my 25 years of surgery, operated a posterior fossa epidural hematoma, which requires a lot of energy. So this patient is truly, truly being hit violently because to have an hematoma here, you need a lot of strength unless you have the rupture of the transverse sinus. Now, which one of these will do good? 
we do, we do really not know. I mean, this taking apart, the prognosis here, there's no way to understand it at the beginning. What, what depends for? It depends the severity of injury. Well, thanks again. And then, and the patient age, okay. Well, we, we can accept that if you are too, too old, okay. But then TBI, you know, as this dichotomy here, it's below 25 and above 75, especially due to falls. Now, here's an example. We have a post-traumatic hematoma. We have a GCS 8, inferior 8. We have midline shift, and we have high intracranial pressure. So they look the same. This one will have a normal life. This one will probably never wake up, most likely be a vegetative, and the other one, we don't know. How do we know these things? <laughs> because we collect data. We are very, very uh, confident that by and large, this is what we know, even if the data sometimes are fuzzy. So observation will generate discovery by deduction. That's what the ancient cause empiricism, and that's what it produces. 70,000 papers. How can you read 70,000 papers? And that's the other paradox. The less we manage, the more we write. Look here. They manage a lot of trauma, but they don't write. Looks like there is a huge paradox of this. And that is the problem. There is no therapy for TBI, not one drug, one. We don't have it. And these are more than 500 research projects, and all these millions of dollars, nothing comes out. Now, we go back to the swelling, the engorgement, and the edema. But before this, we need to have a look at this variable here, which is a very, very complicated matter. In order to understand intracranial pressure, we need to go back a little bit of anatomy and physiology, which um, is always welcome. Now, this is a strange creature inside our brain, especially this one here, the aqueduct of Silvius. Now, this is a true space, something that is cast as, it's like the hole in the donuts, okay? And you can get in and explore this, and you can put a catheter, and you, and you can measure something. But why do we have an intracranial pressure? Because we have an hydraulic resistor, the aqueduct. So we need some pressure to pump the CF flow through its journey. And this is what happens every single heartbeat in our brain, even now, hopefully. So everything is in constant motion. This is very difficult to mathematically model, okay? So also, since there is a rigid, there is no linearity between pressure and volumes. So they change all of a sudden. Now, this is a waveform of the intracranial pressure. And if you put together all this, that's what you have. And this is the relationship from pressure and volume. As you can see, which this, is, this is a very, very typical biological curve. At the beginning, it's OK. You can, you can um, add a lot of volume. Nothing truly changes. But there is one point in which even smaller, completely uh, physiological variation of volume will increase the pressure up here. And look how the amplitude of the waveform has changed. That is a different physiopathologic situation. And we don't want to stay here because we did understand this. So all the therapy today is aimed to come back here. This is the main uh, everyday fight against intracranial hypertension. The nonlinearity of the relationship allows us to uh, understand that more than, a to more than a total volume cannot be tolerated. And the patient needs to be either decompressed or we need to do something. Because here, the physiology is very alterated. <laughs> Nothing is new, huh? In 1977, they thought they found the treasure map. Uh, well, you know, people that dedicated just the life, they notice one thing. ICP kills. If you have high ICP, you're going to die. No question. 
and uh, look at the difference. And the other thing that came out from this data bank was that the drama is completed in 72 hours. Here, this uh, phenomenon will reach a plateau. And as you can see, here is the most, the first 24 hours, the most 24, 30 hours hour uh, is the, are the most representative. So one thing is clear. We need to stay below 20, only in 30% on neurosurgical division we measure intracranial pressure today. Because, for example, the Japanese say, we don't want to measure ICP because it's too complicated. So they declare in a document that they're not going to do that. So t they treat TBI without measuring ICP. So almost 30 years now, OK? This is clear. We need to stay below 20 millimercury. Otherwise, it just doesn't work. But to understand this, we need measurements. And I repeat, only 27% on neuro ICU worldwide will measure ICP. Why ICP is so important? Well, because if you couple ICP with another parameter, which is the mean arterial blood pressure, which is very easy to measure, we can have information about what? About the perfusion pressure, about the uh, true amount of blood that will perfuse the brain. And this is a very, very complex mechanism because here there is a, a powerful regulator. This is the ray, the diameter of the vessel. And if we can change with this, we can multiply a lot. Other parameters is the viscosity and the length. And this is what? The cerebral blood flow. We have standard measurements below which we cannot go because, see, for example, under 15, we, we already have electrical silence, and if we go below, we have a ionic failure up to the level in which we have irreversible membrane damage. What is CVS in normal? It's normal when it satisfies neuronal metabolic demands. Well, how can be CBF so constantly regulated? Because there is a spontaneous variation of resistance. This is a property of the brain in order to ensure correct metabolism. And so <laughs> this is a very, very complex. Uh, but what it tells us is that between this range of mean arterial pressure and this one, you can do whatever you want. The flow will not change because the brain will arrange the resistance just to have the necessary and to avoid unnecessary blood flow. Here, you can follow basically linearly here and so, because you need to come up here. What happens if we do not regulate? Well, this happens. It, it, it happens that the neuronal network will receive or too low, which creates ischemia, or even worse, hyperperfusion. So this is the marvelous buffer system in which if this works, by changes this, nothing happens. But in reality, pressure regulation is strictly coupled with oxygen consumption. So even if you have a right CBF, if the cells are not able to use the oxygen, you will find no difference in the arterial and venous difference in oxygen because oxygen has not been used. You can give the oxygen you want. You can give the CBF you want. But this, we say, is uncoupled. There is no coupling anymore. So what happens? is that when we have an elevation in ICP, by definition, we have a diminishing in CPP. And this, by reaction, causes vasodilation. But the vasodilation increases the volume of the blood. And we cannot afford that. And this will increase again ICP. If something doesn't change, this is an irreversible cascade. What, have to, what we need to do? We need to increase this in order to um, ignite a contrary cascade, which is the vasoconstriction. Now, these concepts are clear 20 years ago. But still, we, when we have to answer this question, what is brain swelling? Well, we know what it is. Because 6 ml of blood will increase the pressure. So it's the blood. Well, OK. If it's the blood, we'll see. We go to the lab. We prepare the animal. We monitor 
bra pressure, intracranial pressure, cerebral bra flow, and cerebral bra volume. We hit the animal, we create a subdural, we give him secondary insult, hypoxia, hypotension, so we created the perfect uh, complex, severely injured patient. Okay? Now, let's see what happened, because this study was done in 2004, and now you, you will see the variables to appear. First, we will refer to this scale here, in which we will see the uh, interaction between arterial blood pressure and intracranial pressure. As you can see, when we give the trauma, there is a tremendous increase and diminish in ICP, diminishing this, see complex loss of autoregulation. The cerebral blood flow is this difference here, and as you can see, it's very low. What about the volume? Not much. Now, here, we decided to operate the animal. So we decompress, and it was efficacious. See, ICP doesn't rise, blood pressure comes back. Look at the CBF. After the evacuation, there is a true hyperemia, which creates a little bit of engorgement, but then, at the end of the game, the cerebral volume didn't change. So, what we had here is a very luxury perfusion for a temporary loss of water regulation. Uh, but there is another condition which does not respect the previous um, behavior. This is just the same thing, but this animal behaves completely different because the evacuation does not produce any effect. The CBF, after the initial increase, will go down, ICP will never change, and the animal will die. This is called the type 2. We know this. We don't know what it is. And, uh, well, given pressure, you will give him pressure to sustain the circle. Look, this is a disaster because outer regulation is completely lost. Because it's not the pressure out of regulation that counts, it's the metabolic one. So, after this, uh, we went to humans and we found exactly the same things. It's not the volume, it's the water. The problem with swelling. This was clear in the humans, uh, we did about six, almost 100 cases. And uh, we found increased CBF, so luxury perfusion, only in the first 24 hours which according to what we saw in the laboratory. But when we measured the water, that was striking. Because as you measure water, you can reconstruct the length fit curve. It's amazing. There's some principle leading this phenomenon. And as you can see, look where the variation is, 20. So even small amount increase in water after the 20 millimercury will give you the rise up of the ICP. Again, we got this. So we know everything. We know vascular engorgement, we know the contusion, the, 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 the hemorrhage, the initial intracranial hypertension, which gives a little bit of ischemia, which creates edema. Okay, we're on top of it, we can fix trauma. Well, this is something that probably we do not understand, but that is a big step ahead. And uh, this is, has become now the major target in neuro ICU. Until you have to stop. Now, nothing is new again. Hmm? The guy understood that, well, if it's not the CSF, it must be the brain, so we need to remove the, brain, the bone. So here is the unleashed decompressive craniectomy. Now, primary and secondary are two different walls. People treat it together. This is a vaccine, this is a last tier therapy. This is something I don't do because I want to prevent swelling, the other is I want to fight intracranial hypertension. When we say decompress, we truly mean decompress. We take out a big piece of bone, more than 100 cubic centimeters. Uh, well, they did, they did a very, very um, important review. What are ICP? Okay, ICP will go down. Of course, we changed the rules of engagement. But take one, class evidence. Conclusion, significant decrease in ICP, fewer days in ICU, but worse outcome of six months. The trial was interrupted. It was the first looking for class evidence because systematic review in a clinic, you know, it's a level of certainty that must be 
always, always supported by this. Now, what is the refractory ICP? More than 20, 15 minutes. Come on, 15 minutes, you can fix everything. Well, take two, which is the most beautiful acronym I ever heard, rescue ICP, with a double intent to rescue the failure of the previous and this randomized evaluation of surgery we connect them for uncontrollable level elevation of ICP. This is the most important trial of history in decompressive craniectomy, and we will analyze the result as been done by the Cambridge School. Now, outcome scale here has been used uh, using the extended scale. But here, that vegetative, lower visibility, and upper visibility are the bad ones. So these are the bad outcomes. The lower and the upper and these are the good outcome. Now, Look at the surgical group. There are definitely less death. So surgery saves your life. But look at the vegetative states. They are much, much more. And look at the lower severe disability. They are much, much more, and they are reaching each other. So if I apply dichotomized outcome, there's no much different, only internal distribution. So we do not let die, okay. What about good recovery? A little disturbing, because good recovery have the same good recovery, even without decompressive craniectomy. So how do we know before? At three o'clock in the morning. So this is something that needs to be addressed, because what we obtain here is we don't let this patient die, but still, we are not able to grant any decent quality of life because we just made damage control. We did not put any restorative action, any comeback action, and these are the terrible conclusion of the SQICP, which is the only weapon we have today, and that was 22% lower in mortality. That's a clear data and something that is undisputable. But at six months and then even, even more at one year. But surgery was associated with higher rates of vegetative state, lower severe disability, and upper severe disability. The percentage of the bad outcome is the same, only they didn't die. So we saved the life. But the rates of moderate or good recovery remain similar. And that's scary, because you risk to be decompressed when you don't need it. But we need to know who is candidate to decompression because decompression is not an easy procedure and cranioplasty carries 30% of complications. We need to understand why these people do not come back to normal life. And I think we need a second time for this. Thank you. It is a joke. It is not finished. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. We need. No, no, I'm not going. Away. It's, we have, it's, it's we that have just we, we, we organize a, a, a two, yeah. a two uh, just to, to breathe because I need to go, you know, with the time and you know it's a little bit. Um, second. Now, this uh, just to tell us what are we missing. Well, some years ago, another problematic paper was published. Look at the names. Are the same guys of the Glasgow Common Scale. So these are expert people. What they did is they analyzed autopsy of these numbers of severe um, TBI survivor dead after one month. Uh, 35 of them were veg, 30% were severely disabled, and 20 moderately disabled. The most striking data is this. 
What about the other half? We're dealing with intracranial hypertension, but only half. And the other one is this. 67% ischemic brain damage. But the most striking is this. 58% of thalamic damage in the terms of diffuse axonal injury. Look at the contusion. Contusions are, also, are always there. But contusion, you know, are the less worrying thing. Uh, this is an old diagram today, very criticizable, made from John Pavlich many years ago, in which he, he, he reached the conclusion there were two types of trauma. The focal trauma, where we see everything, and the non-focal trauma, if we don't see nothing and we imagine things. And uh, in this diffuse uh, half of the screen, we introduce the diffuse axonal injury. The diffuse axonal injury is a, a type of damage that has been thought for many years that it was directly connected. But the rabbit hole goes very deep because we need to go down and understand all the complex network and all that has been alterated. And this is what we call the, um, diffuse axonal injury. It's a nanopathology. It's something at minus nine. It's something we do not see, and it's very difficult to recreate. And we have always been aware of this since the, the 70s. And dye was described as a pattern defined, which is not diffuse. It's truly diffuse, and it's everywhere. So the conclusion of that paper was that the dominant factor in vegetative state is the severity of diffuse injury. Because as long as you have a focal injury, as long as they remove you a contusion or an hematoma, if you do, did not suffer diffuse pathology, you have good chance to recover. So there's some basic damage we do not see. And we need to know what it is, because we are stuck at this point here. Uh, what probably cannot imagine very well is what is the neuronal network. The axonal traffic is a continuous and, and completely reversible formation of microtubes, thousands and thousands of per minute, as you see the motor protein that transport the vesicles. Okay? This is a very complex uh, system and requires lots of energy. These are the axonal bulbs. This is the histological translation of diffuse axonal injury. This is what we see. But what you see this, the brain is gone. But when it happens, well, I know, diffuse axonal injury, it becomes at the time of the impact and is the cutting of the essence. Well, we don't believe it anymore. This assumption lasted for years, has been truly challenged. What happens if you poke a neuron? If you poke a neuron, you will have axonal bulb retraction and you see a ball, axoplasmatic ball, and then the macrophage macrophages comes and eat it. So what happens also? <laughs> it happens that a lot, you know, hemorrhage apart, a lot of mechanisms intervene, mechanical shearing, huge depolarization, and amino acid release, saturation of this receptor, all this will provoke imbalances of calcium, activates activation of what doesn't have to be activated because it's dangerous, and it produces free radicals, but at the end of the story, what happens truly is that this will cause a dramatic alteration of this. So mitochondrial malfunctioning, and we go back to the lab and traumatize our poor rat. And uh, you know, we keep on uh, with, <laughs> with the, the red eye was, was my. Uh, see, this is a perfect model for diffuse axonal injury, OK? We started in 1997, and uh, we said, why we are so convinced to study severe injury? Let's see what happens in mild injury, so maybe we can learn from a less irreversible phenomenon. Remember, GCS doesn't give you information about the severity of injury. It gives information about the severity of consciousness alteration. We assume it's the same. Maybe it's not, or sometimes it's not, but we have no clue. So we started to analyze energetic metabolites because we were very 
<coughs> shape at that time. And we start analyzing ATP and GTP and all the catabolites. And you know, this, is what, this was a protocol already um, started. And what we find out is mild injury. At six hours, we have 50% depletion of ATP. That's not truly mild. Everything recovered. But then we were able to stay, since the catabolism continues, that it was a good demonstration of an energetic crisis after a simple hit at one meter, so um, mild. But look at the nicotinic enzymes. Same, a little bit shifted, but same diagram. And this gives other information, and the mitochondrial impairment is due to the absence of the coenzymes for the equivalent restitution of the redox to create ATP. Well, but that depends on um, ischemic insult and apoxia. No, because when intubated these animals, the results are the same. So this means something that we didn't know before. And uh, this means that it's not the hypoxic ischemic condition that determine the result. That is something that is very difficult to put down in paper. And in fact, we receive a lot of criticism. But then we were able to say the trauma is directly responsible of the biochemical change and the energetic imbalance is triggered within minutes. Why? Because this is what happens very, very beginning. The glutamate storm is a disaster because it triggers and saturates the receptor and creates the massive sodium calcium disequilibrium. When trauma arrives, what happens is that, that was to wake you up a little bit, at the, the, at this, all the vesicles here are transmitted into the intersynaptic space and the glutamate go and saturate the AMPA and MDA receptor and this creates the ionic fluxes go on and on. So it's just basic physiology functioning on the other way out. It's unforgiven because what happens is that we have permeability, mitochondria are full of calcium, we activate calcium dependent proteases and generate a lot of enemies. This happens one minute after trauma. We were able to detect malondehaldehyde one minute. Now this was the never written paper and it's, it took us 10 years to write this paper. Uh, we, did, we had a lot of joke about this paper. So, but at the end, it was a very difficult paper to write because writing a paper that oxidative stress is proportional to the severity, is another indicator of the injury severity. It was never been written before. So this is for the students, allow me this. When you're in the lab, empiricism is not enough. You need something else. You know what you need? You need imagination. You need to dare, you need to say, something that will be criticized. You need to guess, you need to test. Then you make discovery. And that's what happened to us. We started to study a new molecule that we never considered before, which is aspartate and acetylated. What it is? Well, it is the most present substance in the neurons, and it contains 10 millimolars. It's a huge amount. Nobody knows what's for, but it's too much to be ignored. Okay, so many theories, but, you know, just coincidence, it is synthesized into the mitochondria. Well, then we went back to the lab and tried to understand in which of this intricated map, basically NAA intervenes in a lot of molecular process. As a acetyl donor, as a myelin formation, as a um, glutamine uh, um, cycle, and as the uh, um, participation to somehow indirectly to energetic metabolism. So it's truly central. Again, it is a very particular and expensive molecule because every time the cell synthesize one NAA, it renounced to eight ATP. So a cell that put on NAA, it's a healthy and rich cell. It cannot be a damaged cell because it doesn't have money to throw away. So that is an expensive uh, molecule. And it gives us a marker. We went back to the lab 
We did mild TBI, severe TBI, and even more severe, we had hypoxia, hypotension. Okay, we wanted to know the true damage, and this was striking. We didn't know this, but NAA behave like ATP. They are specular, so they follow some principle, even in mild, and the same thing in severe. They look the same thing. We go to um, secondary insult, we see at two hours, 50% reduction with no possibility of recovery of 48 hours. This is devastating. Look at the ATP, same. So NAA and ATP, they run together. They probably express the same cellular disturbance. At 48 hours, with this model, the game is over. You will see at 48 hours, you can distinguish almost exclusively metabolically the severity of injury. This is the severity of injury, the metabolic derangement. And we, for the first time, have found a marker. So NAA is not an indicator of neuronal loss, because we don't have such neuronal loss in that model. We, we, we can confirm a histology. But sometimes, uh, somehow, NAA is the witness of cellular unfunctional state. So does NAA reduction represent metabolically dysfunctional neurons? Most likely, yes. Most likely, this is the indicator of uh, uh, this condition. And if you, you don't need this. If you add this, of course, you have uh, much more uh, damage, but you don't need this. You can have the same type of damage without it. If you plot, you scatter plot, ATP and NAA, you have a straightforward line. Never happened in biology. Nothing is linear. Not even this, because here you can see that another cluster has determined here. So THH completely shifts the gravity of damage, severity of damage. Okay? So we need to stay here because we strongly believe, because we've written and nobody protested, <laughs> that this, there is a threshold of not coming back. And we were able to write this. The, the reduction of NEA depends on the severity, is an indicator of the, severity, of the severity of injury, and is decreased because traumatic energetic disturbance. No ischemia, no hypoxia. So this was the first time. Well, but that's in the laboratory. What about men? Even better. We see NAA. Where is it? We see huge peak at 2 ppm with spectroscopy. And we measure NAA in vegetative states. And that's what it is. And we differentiated NAA in different recovery. So we need to go back and truly understand what happens during these disturbances. And we need to go back to the mitochondria, because we are sure that the center of this is this weird creature. Now, <laughs> you will find everything on the mitochondria, but we are interested in this. This is the electron transport chain. Here is our life. We depend on this oxidor. I'm scared when I think of these things, because I'm a surgeon. So if I think that my life depends on a proton, I'm a little bit, you know, aggravated by these things, but that's the way it is, okay? If the NAD doesn't give you this proton and this electron, this, this doesn't work, and you know what it does? It phosphorylates ADP and gives birth to ADP. It's, it's, it seems a sort of orange squeezing ADP. See, this is a nice representation, okay? We live with this. Uh, well, we were here. Now we need to go on the other part of the cell, in the mitochondria and in the cytoplasm. So starting from the glucose, we need to go here. We need to understand which direction it will take. If the pyruvate, pyruvate, the hydrogenase will take it into the Krebs cycle. If it's activated lactate, the hydrogenase, it will go back. And we accumulate lactate. So this is a fundamental circle by which we strictly depend and what we did. We wanted to study the gene expression of this protein. So we'll go back in the lab again. It, it, it lasted 28 years, so we did a lot of time. 
We did our experiments. We divided mild, severe, and we did craniectomy. We did the preparation, and we studied the metabolism, and we studied the gene expressions. This time, we want to go up to the end of the rabbit hole, like in the first clip. Okay. So, uh, of course, we did sham. Sham in this case are very are very important because there is a lot of uh, doing. Now, let's take about um, let's think about um, glycolysis. All enzymes for the glycolysis are enhanced early and late in the mild and early in the severe. So in severe, there is an immediate activation of this. What about others? Well, again. In, in severe, the black one, we have immediate uh, persistent activation. In mild, we have a delayed and gradual activation of these genes codifying for the expressions of this protein because we want the glycolysis to go on. What about the lactate dehydrogenase? Well, as you see in my TBI, it doesn't change because we don't need the lactate. We need the other one. But what happens in severe TBI, it is much more represented, it's much more pushed, it's much more replicated, because we have this catabol that we need to go back and become lactate because the part of it door is shut. And what about lactate? Increase very much. Look at the black. And the ATP-ADP ratio, completely uh, gone. Okay, so this is the picture of an uncoupled state. Let's resume. In my TBI, there is a sort of resetting. There is an early decrease, while in severe TBI, there is a permanent failure with a steady condition of energetic imbalance. There is a late overexpression of this for the glycolysis, and there's early overexpression of this. There is no recovery of ATP, but the most important things, in mild TBI, we, you, we do not have a true hyperglycolysis because lactate is normal. So again, what happens in TBI, severe? Well, we have a respiratory paralysis. We don't breathe, basically. We have a compensatory true hyperglycolysis, but it's not efficient. We have a lot of lactate, and we have high lactate part of it. We monitor this with microdialysis intensive care units. We didn't understand nothing. So, a step forward, I want to see the pyruvate dehydrogenase because he is the true policeman. And this is a marvelous picture of this complex enzyme. This regulates the entrance of the pyruvates into the Grab cycle. And also, we found out, we didn't find out, we knew, but you know, we studied the regulation and expression. There are basically four genes that regulate the PDH. These are the gene that activates, and these are the genes that disactivates. As you can see, in severe, the PDH is shut down, doesn't have to move. While is enhanced in mild, here all the genes codifying for the kinases that block the PDH activity. So the pyruvate doesn't go into the cell. Is the is the, is the, sex up, the Krebs cycle all up here, all down here? So this is forbidden. Uh, what is a mitochondrial dysfunction? It's a post-glycolytic breakdown. It's a PDH inhibition. It's a TCA deregulation. When? During the time of maximum need. So this is bankrupt. And this is true uh, damage. Now, the last thing that we study it's a very curious phenomenon that I was not aware of until somebody taught me, that we have a mitochondrial quality control system. Mitochondria are very active creatures. They move a lot, and they replicate, and they go into fusion or into fission, like this one here that's already separated. Then they come together, and they merge together. They never, they never stop. So there is a an entire world of genes that regulates this, like genes that promote fusion. Fusion is good, fission is bad. Fission means that mitochondria must die, be uh, englobated by other cells. And they use these proteases here. Now, look here. In severe TBI, all 
thing, all genes and proteins that will enhance fission are increased, dramatically increased. Look at what happens in, uh, um, in my TBI, the cytoid synthase, which is expressed of the mitochondrial mass, is augmented, like here. Here, my TBI produces almost a, a doping effect on the mitochondria. It will increase the mitochondria. So putting all together, it becomes a very complex picture. The glutamate store, the voltage dependent, uh, distorted channels, the big increase of sodium, calcium, the uh, stop of the, glyc of the um, Krebs cycle, the go back to the glycolysis, the gene regulation, the production of lactate, the signal to go to fission, the uh, deliverance of citrate synthase, which is a huge apoptotic signal. When, when uh, uh, citrate synthase is out of the mitochondria, that's an apoptotic signal. So this is what we miss in the first diagram. This is why we are stuck after decompress a patient, because we miss cellular toxicity, subcellular metabolic damage, which are the true origin of edema. And uh, so it is the metabolic diagnosis, we don't know. But what we know is that if you want to know how truly is injured the brain, you need to measure something else. You need to keep ICP and CPP and everything, but we need to measure something. So the conclusion is that the cellular world reset to a new lower rate. We stop working because we are sick, so we reorganize all the priorities and the cell function, and we will do this. It is regulated at this level. There's nothing to do. We need to go here and understand, because it goes here. According to Gene Ontology Project, there are three families of genes. The one that um, are involved in molecular function, biological, and cellular. Well, these are the only affected probably by multi-BI. Severe TBI takes all of it. All these are re-expressed, rearranged, so there's something we truly don't understand, the trauma itself cannot be able to provoke this. And all the genes are down-regulated. Well, I did something I didn't. What happened? No. I have to start again. <laughs> you take the blue pill. No. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. No. It was too good to be true, huh? Well, to, to keep attention in life for two hours, we needed to come up with a new format. So we adopted this very risky. The first time I present, we know slides. Uh, you know, just, sorry. It's the first time that I run. Um, cannot be finished. They say it's finished, but maybe during the import. He said he's okay, so he's the man on the mountain. This is the argument I can talk less, so I just, maybe I, uh, we just need to conclude. We were so close to conclusion. There's no much left.
Fabiano. No, no, no. Fatto per figure peggiori. Yeah, I did much worse, don't worry. I just reached my limit. Sublim subcellular damage. Uh, meanwhile, maybe it's time for some conclusion. As a clinician, as a surgeon, that, you know, as a, as a person who opens skulls and removes hematomas and then look waiting as it was a religious uh, statement, uh, for the patient to wake up. We now remove the bone, we resolve the intracranial pressure, but we let the brain swell even more. Uh, we know that uh, uh, sometimes the brain swelling will stop, and we have to deal with something that remains. The true prognostic indicator is what remains. Thank you very much. They are the best. So these are all downregulated. So the cell, it looks like they voluntarily shut down, and that was something truly weird that did we discover, that we see that this is the same almost thing that happens during hibernation. Well, coma changes completely its philosophy and becomes a neuroprotection program. And the sequence of genes that activate this are very similar to the species that they need to down the metabolic rate to go to hibernation. So my TBI tells us that the genes may enhance recovery. We can manipulate positively. Severe TBI tells us that the genes are, oh, there's a the music here. We need to shut it down. What we need to avoid is this because this is what trauma does, and this is what we deal with, up to the point that the system doesn't work anymore, and we declare what? Vegetative state, system failure. We, are, we don't know how to reboot this, and we need to find a way to do this. Otherwise, this is an incurable disease. My personal opinion, if the metabolic suppression represents an adaptation of nature, TBI represents the adaptive response of the hard sciences to the soft sciences of the human behaviors, because trauma can be truly avoidable. And uh, physics and chemics do not forgive. And this dedicated to the maestro, Anthony Marmaro. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. It is a very fascinating speech about the traumatic brain injury. Um, thanks also for all of the biochemical ideas and the biochemical okay, uh, reports. And uh, please, if you have any question, don't be shy. I know that there is a yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Lazzarino. <laughs> Stefano, thank you very much for your presentation. Wonderful and uh, absolutely full of information. But you just mentioned concussion. Could you please tell us something more about this very particular, yes. Very phenomenal. particular, and yeah. uh, many times. Very particular, even not more particular. considered from a clinical point of view. And also the difference between the, the real traumatic brain injury and because the concussion, also because. Since we, there is a lot of young people, most of them probably doing sports activities. Yeah. You can explain oh. them something and about the risks also. 
this peculiar. Okay, so all yeah. of them stops to perform any type <laughs> no, uh, of physical activity. We discussed this with uh, Professor Tavazzi, and uh, we decided to avoid the argument because it deserves another meeting just for that. But we stay in the realm of mild TBI. And I tell you, there is nothing mild in my TBI, only the conscious alteration. The disturbance is profound. Well, but it's irreversible. But the problem with the concussive injury, which is basically the mildest form of the mild traumatic brain injury, according to GCS, people don't, not suffer much uh, at the time of the impact, they will suffer later, but they are mostly behavioral and uh, psychological disturbances. The true risk is that they uh, put the brain in a dangerous state of vulnerability. You see that after six hours in the lab, the, the NAA and the ATP were very down and then recover. We don't know exactly the time frame in men, but we know that if you receive a second, even milder TBI, and you are in that condition of metabolic derangement, you are recovering because all the genes are pumping up the molecules. If you receive another stupid hit, you risk severe traumatic brain injury. We demonstrated this first, the biochemical hypothesis of the vulnerable brain in 2005, I guess. So once you hit your head, stay home. Don't take another hit. That is the main message, but I think this will deserve. Of course, sports activity is the most frequent, but then you can have a motorbike accident on Tuesday, and then on Saturday, you go to play soccer. Concussion doesn't have a nature, just a hit to the brain. So if you sum the two, you risk malignant swelling, decompressive craniectomy. That's what you risk. And the fact that we cannot fix trauma, we don't know yet, but we are getting down. Thank you for the question. So, any other questions? If you don't feel confident in English, you also can use, utilize Italians, of course, if you prefer. No, don't be shy. Uh. Thank you very much. It was really very, very interesting. Uh, I have a question. Um, during the biochemical injury, which is ATP decrease and all the mitochondrial dysfunction, uh, it is observed that uh, uh, the brain loses a lot of magnesium. So <laughs> I was wondering if you ever consider these, uh, yeah. these aspects, because not only magnesium, as you know, binds to ATP, and ATP works as a, an ATP magnesium complex, exactly. but also uh, decrease of magnesium also is pro, uh, is pro inflammatory, is pro uh, radical formation. So I think that uh, it could be uh, um, a very important aspect besides the yes. main. Uh, ATP to be investigated, so. yes. Okay. You know, the intu intuitively, y y y you can. Um, hypothesize that since there's less ATP, there's probably, but you know, this is too simple. Uh, the complex ATP magnesium is the way ATP travels uh, in the cells. Uh, personally, we have never studied this, but um, um, there are so many things that happens together. I don't have an answer to this. Maybe somebody that of yes. you that studied it, because- It is possible also. It also involves another path that don't really remember it, but please. It, it, yes, it is. With, uh, maybe some kind of uh, treatment. Uh, you know, providing it, uh, magnesium could help in restoring uh, all the damage. In the energetic yeah. metabolism, you mean? Energetic yes, energetic of course. Yes, yes, it is possible. Okay, in the future, it is possible also to yeah. consider yeah. this it, it, it particular biochemical aspect. the occasion. 
this is also always been an idea of, of Professor Lazzarino. It's not one drug that will solve this problem. It will be a simultaneous attack because everything is balanced in adverse pathophysiology. It's truly adverse physiology. Please, jump. Yes. You have just all my question. I was <laughs> looking for oh. some pharmacological treatment, if you can imagine some approach. Yeah. Well, Since one you, you correctly <laughs> said that we still don't have any, any kind of drug for TBI, but you just we answered. When, when Peter Atkinson proposed the rescue ICP, the title was surgery for brain edema. Surgery for brain edema. We don't have one pill for brain edema. We use manitol, but manitol is just an osmotic and doesn't work as an osmotic. It works at rheologic uh, properties. Steroids against cellular edema, steroids have been excluded by every treatment. It's the only negative standard that we have in TBI today. Do not use steroids. So what we have? Nothing. We have 30, degree, th 30 degrees H above bed in order to prevent vascular engorgement. What else? We have, I don't know, decompressive caniectin. When we don't understand, we break the rules of engagement. We change physiology. We don't have the cranium anymore, so it's not intracranial pressure anymore. It's something else, intracutaneous pressure. Yes, of course. But um, we need at least one drug to reverse what is still reversible, and we don't have it. Okay, thanks. No more questions? Yeah. What is the involvement of aquaporin in brain edema? Have you any idea? <laughs> is there any evidence? Uh, probably the next step will be to study gene expression of aquaporin. One, two, three, four. Yeah. Uh, Mainly uh, four. The, uh? Mainly four. Mainly four. The, the, there was an idea of Tony Marmaro before passing to better life, and uh, it was the last two or three years, he was completely maniac about aquaporins, uh, and um, because it looks like, apart the ionic dysregulation that we create the electrochemical gradient, some, th there are some conditions that will open uh, a proper channel of water to come in. And so that was, since you know, the, he, was, he was maniac about edema, he died of, lung edema, and he, he, he is assessing this publicly. So aquaporin, I think, is the truly next step, probably, we need to understand what regulates the aquaporin, because they have a complex physiological role, but we really, we really uh, studies only peculiar aspect of this, and um, so far we just need to uh, put all the pieces together. The most difficult thing is to put all, because not all the combinations are possible. So I think uh, after, but we need to create data. We need people in the laboratory. We need researcher. We, be, we need people who imaginate, like I have the dream of the coenzyme Q. Do you remember my dream of the nicotine coenzymes? You need some passion to understand and to experiment. This is last, <laughs> last question. Oh, I can be, I can be here the whole you day. Are you, know, you know me. What is the role of neuroinflammation during TBI and <laughs> after TBI? Yeah. Because but it's a, 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 lot, a of, lot of papers are coming yeah, out well, on neuroinflammation. Thank you for this. And the role after. Inflammation in the early 90s was the treasure map. Everybody wants to explain everything with the cytokine cascade and the fibrinogen. It's important, okay. Uh, one molecule, well, 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 one uh, ml of blood is able to create huge inflammation. Uh, inflammation is another adverse physiology because 
coagulation and uh, some immunological cascades and the third phase like fibrinolysis, they are all linked and that's basically information. This complex system, when they work, they're beautiful. But when they don't work, they create a lot of damage. So we tried indomedicine. We tried all types of anti-inflammatory. The problem is they first interact with the platelets. So in hemorrhagic trauma, you know, inhibition of uh, cyclooxygenase is not a good thing to give. Uh, inflammation, uh, the way we see it today, it's important at the beginning. But somebody says, no, it's much important a lot after. So we need to put all these pieces together. Um, I think the most rapid deregulation is induced by trauma and is the oxid sons of trauma. And it, it, we've been seeing this in 25 years and never had one data again. So this is a clear law. It happens immediately and then it evolves and it will become a cascade. Okay, thanks. So? No, I Oh, I thought you wanted to. Okay, thanks. <coughs> So I want just uh, to thank you again, and uh, I hope to see you again here to speak uh, again about, uh, in this time, the brain concussion, the, concussion, the yeah. second part, yeah. uh, of course, uh, yeah. also because I think that is more interesting for the students, for the guys, because it is related, of course, also to a lot of sports. different types of sports, contact sports, and, and not only contact sports, okay? Thanks uh, to all for your presence. Uh, thanks uh, to professors. Uh, and so we will see very soon. And thank you to Wonder Woman, which is the nickname of Professor Tavazzi. <laughs> Twenty-eight years. So we will see after out. <laughs> yes. Well, I've done worse. Thank you. Thank you.